Welcome back to Power and Politics. Well, the automo automotive business has been a cornerstone of the Canadian industry for years, but that's all changing as we speak. The industry has faced near collapse in the last number of years. It's now finding, though, a new and profitable way to survive. But what happens? Will the jobs continue to disappear as the companies make more money? What should the government's role be in sustaining the auto sector? We go out, as so we find out, as Power and Politics goes on the money. Join me now, David Mondragon, the CEO of Ford Canada. Good to see you. Well, thanks for having me. You had a speech at the Canadian Club of Ottawa about the role of government in the auto industry. Now, Ford didn't get a bailout, although you guys did get about $300 million in support from the government. What do you think the role now vis-a-vis -vis the car industry and government ought to be? Well, the role is really to collaborate on the industry going forward. There's a lot of issues facing the industry. Uh, well, first, we've got some great standards that have been harmonized, harmonized across North America with regard to fuel efficiency and CAFE regulations. I think as we go forward, there's a lot of opportunity to work with government on sustainable platforms. You know, Ford's number one in Canada right now, best-selling car company. But, you know, some of your competitors, like GM and Chrysler, they got big bailouts, both mm -hmm. south of the border and here. Now they're competing against you guys. Is that fair to take government money bailouts and then start competing against companies like yours that didn't get a bailout? Yeah, well, the fact of the matter is the only benefit uh, of going bankruptcy is writing off a lot of debt. Uh, at Ford, we had a plan in place that helped us avoid that. We went to the financial markets early. We took a major capital improvement loan, uh, the largest in the history of the, uh, the industry, $23 billion. Uh, and we leveraged ourselves very aggressively. We leveraged the Ford Oval. And we did it because we wanted to manage and be in charge of our own destiny. We wanted to manage our own plan going forward. Uh, and that's helped us really change the hearts and minds of a lot of consumers. But internally at the company, it's created great resolve for us as a company but, as well. Uh, but has government bailouts, I know it saved jobs industry, we talk about that, but is it mm -hmm. unfair competition? Yeah, you know, we're looking at the Ford plan going forward, and, and we're not going to pin ourselves or worry about what, what happened in leverage points for the competition. We're focused on the Ford plan. And actually, uh, what we're also doing is managing our finances very closely. We've drawn down this year alone $12.8 billion of debt. We've saved ourselves a billion dollars in interest this year alone. So we're going to work with our stakeholders. We're managing our financial position. We're making money as a company as well. Uh, and so we feel good about the Ford plan. All right, now let me just show our viewers here talk about uh, increasing car sales there's big incentives and I don't know how good those are for the business are certainly good for consumers but Ford out of the big three automaker sales I want to show you Ford it's got a 20 percent increase we've got GM at 27 and Chrysler at 28 percent growth oh, that's all good what I can't figure out is and help me explain Ford's growing Ford's making money and Ford is still closing plants like in St. Thomas, Ontario. So there's jobs that are being lost and people talk about this jobless recovery. So h how do you make money and recover and still close plants? Species. Yeah. See, I, I wouldn't agree with that. I think there's a great opportunity for the auto worker in Canada and globally. Uh, what's happening is there's a remix in terms of uh, supply and demand. Uh, and capacity is being drawn down in North America because it needed to be. It was well, well overcapacitized. Capacity utilization in North America in 2009 was only 55 percent. So there was way much. So you're making way more too cars than people are buying. And we were forcing uh, product in the market. Traditionally, in the first half of the decade, uh, the, con the industry was building cars that consumers didn't necessarily want. But we built them because we had to run our plants and we had to run them efficiently. So we forced high levels of incentives and high levels of volume to keep our plants running. What we did during the down turn it forward is again we've closed 30 plants so we've right sized our production to meet the demands of consumers but do those now, jobs come there, back there is a there is a sacrifice and that's headcount I said we let go 120,000 employees at Ford we had to make those hard decisions to be able to survive and finance uh, finance our future on our own terms without the assistance of the government so as you so look those at jobs it, are gone like, well, I just uh, because of productivity yeah. and because as you say that the, the market demand you know mm. we, we got an we got an employment crisis here and I, I understand companies yeah. have to, but this is the jobless recovery. You, you hammer your productivity, but that means you, yeah. we can't hire the same amount of jobs. It's not a jobless recovery, though. If you look at the growth that's happening in emerging markets, there's plenty of growth. There's maybe not growth here in Canada. We're seeing growth overseas in India, in, in China. We're seeing a lot of growth in Mexico, growth in North America as well as they're stabilizing the plants. As the industry starts to pick up, and it is growing now, in North America, U.S., and Canada, there'll be an opportunity to add more shifts, and that will bring more jobs to market as well. What's the message to the government here? Here we are on the cusp of signing a free trade agreement with with a country like South Korea. Now, there's been a lot of uh, 
talk around this recovery. You talk about growth in emerging markets, but we've got not a good balance of trade. They're selling to us. We're not selling to them. Are the markets really open? Is China open? Is India open? Is South Korea really open so companies like yours can sell cars there and maybe create jobs here? Yeah, it's not open today. But hopefully with a new pact that's been agreed in the U.S., it'll get ratified. And if it does, it will start to open a market that's been very closed. There's no market in the world that's as closed today than, uh, than uh, South Korea. And if you look at uh, the Korean market, it's 80% dominated by one manufacturer. No other market is like that. So uh, it's a great opportunity. If you look at the big three, GM, Ford, and Chrysler, in 2009, combined basis, we sold less than 10,000 vehicles in that market. They sold over a million vehicles in North America. So a lot of inequities right now. There's a great opportunity, if we look at Canada, to potentially harmonize with the U.S. pact that they just agreed to that will open the doors for, for fair trade. And the issue... Issue Korea wasn't so much free trade, it was about fair trade, equitable trade, and equitable distribution of, of uh, properties throughout the country, and, and our ability to export into that country. Is our government doing enough to reduce those barriers? Well, I think our, company, our country uh, right now is working very closely with industry. Uh, they're in a position right now that they're going to follow the U.S. because the U.S. has already made a pack. Uh, we need to move forward, and I think we, we need to move forward swiftly. We have to be very cautious, though, in terms of the barriers that we have here. There's a huge, there's a huge issue with regard to currency manipulation uh, in markets like Korea, uh, and we've got to take that into account. And we have to look at the longevity of the trade drawdown. Uh, and if there is going to be an agreement in the PAC in Canada, uh, we think it should have a similar accord to the U.S. with a 10-year drawdown. I got a, one last question, and I know I'm focusing on jobs because that that's a key political issue. You know, when Ford gets 300 million dollars from the government, but not bailout money, but support. What more can be done to keep manufacturing jobs here in Canada? I know you talk about the growth overseas, but people say, look, you can pay a worker in Mexico or in South Korea or in India and China a lot less money than a Canadian auto worker. What's the case to bring more manufacturing jobs and keep that base here in Canada? It's a great question, and I spent a lot of time talking to government about that, as well as, as other members of the Canadian Council of Chief Executives. Where this is a very hot topic of discussion. If you look at manufacturing as a percent of GDP in Canada, and, you, and it is declining, you're right. It's down from about 20% a decade ago to about 12% 12 12%, in Canada. That's right. And the U.S. is down from about 19% to 11%. So the U.S. has taken some very aggressive stances, and the, and the Obama administration has put a lot of money behind uh, growing the, uh, the middle class and growing the manufacturing percent of GDP. Uh, they're going to not only stabilize, but they're going to grow that footprint going forward. I'm very concerned in Canada, though, it's going to continue to de deteriorate and it'll draw itself down to single digits if we don't get much more aggressive as a country to incentivize How? not only what's companies the and investments. So what's the well, incentive? Well, it's not fun incentive is what I think we need to like have. Like lower tax? To, to well, bring? lower tax helps for Canadian investment. It's not so much an impetus for U.S. investment in Canada, although it is helpful. Uh, what we need to have is upfront seed money to be able to, to put plants in place. Look, the Canadian dollar is now close to parity. That's an issue because most of our infrastructure, most of our wages and our pensions are based on an 80 cent dollar. So we do pay a premium here for, High for workforce. Tough. High dollar is difficult, especially when you're exporting the majority of your vehicles. And we export, again, 90% of our vehicles into these other markets. So uh, we, we are set up and in our, in our infrastructure is set up for a lower dollar, an 80 cent dollar, let's say. So the initial infrastructure, the initial investment that needs to be made, it's not just to bring new jobs and new plants, but it's to retool our plants, needs to be the focus. And what Canada needs to be, in my mind, it needs to be even more aggressive than some of these emerging markets. And aggress aggressive markets like Mexico, South America, and even the U.S. are, are vying for these businesses and, and these jobs and these manufacturing footprints for the long haul. And they're winning a lot of those bids now because they're very, very aggressively soliciting it. And they're paving the way for those companies that come in with legislation that supports it and dollars up front, dollars for those investments. We got to leave it here, but a real interesting discussion, and that is going to be nothing short of a trade war to keep uh, jobs in countries or where they don't just go to the lowest common denominator. David Mondragon, good to see you. Well, thanks for having me. As a CEO of Ford Canada, I did that interview a little earlier in the week. Uh, Rosemary Barton's here, coming up with the highlight of the day, maybe the highlight of your week. Stay with us.